Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us worship God together. Good morning and welcome to Ecclesia. We're delighted that you've chosen to worship with us, whether you're online, as a lot of our folks are, or in the room, as a lot more of our folks are, or if you are worshiping later today or this week on YouTube, however you join Ecclesia, you're part of us and we're glad you're here. We always begin our worship by speaking into our presence, those who are not with us. And we always start with our brothers and sisters worshiping in Lava Ita, Cuba. And today, we want to especially remember them because there has been a new um, regulation in Cuba this week that has changed the provision from daily bread to every other daily bread. There's a concern in the country now that there will be more people who die from starvation than from COVID. Do you know who is the first to die from starvation? The children. And the senior adults. So people are losing their grandparents and their children <coughs> in the, at the same time. And so, followers of Christ, we are called to the work of justice. You can very easily go to your senator's website, you can just, like, if you don't know who your senator is, you do know who the president is, so just go of the president.gov. And if even you put it in wrong, it'll still find it. There's a contact page put in there to lift the embargo back here, but you don't have to spell it right. You don't have to say it right. You just say, Mr. President, we compel you to give food to the hungry in the name of Jesus to the people of Cuba. That simple. I invite you to do that this week as we remember them um, in our worship and in our prayers. There are others who are not with us today. Valaya couldn't be here today. She has a little bit of a sniffle, so she might be watching online. So we're hoping that she's um, sitting in Lupe's lap right now watching online. We can, we hope for that. Um, there are others who are not with us. Uh, would you like to speak them into our presence today? Ashley, I was thinking Ashley was going to Ashley was going to come. Maybe she'll make it before we're we're done here. Others, Kim and Stan, there they. This is their first Sunday in Havana. It was not last week. I thought it was last week. This is their first Sunday in Havana. Others, uh, Dana and Coy, have they arrived online? Dana and Coy, um, let's remember them. Dana is uh, scheduled to read scripture next week, so I hope we get to see them next week. So whoever you are, wherever you're worshiping, we are glad that you are with us today. Let us worship God as we sing our opening hymn. Good morning. So uh, we're going to start off actually using the hymn, knowing that after that we're going on our own. So um, page 69, we are one in the spirit, and that's... Uh, uh, really good uh, song to remember as, as we just heard that about Cuba. We're, no matter where we're at, Cuba here, we're all together as Christians and one in the spirit. And I think we're really drawn to, to help each other out. So let's get uh, worship started with uh, We Are One in the Spirit.
with the new. God is in our land, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus. Thank you, Chris. Love that song. Could sing it every week. It's kind of a kind of like an ecclesia theme song. Uh, truly love that song. Sang that when I was a teenager in youth group. So that's a that's an oldie but a goodie. That means that song is at least uh, forty five years old. It's a good song. Okay, okay, Chris. Chris said it is old. Yeah, 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 don't do it. Don't don't do it. Yeah. We're going to um we're going to cut Chris's pay after that. That's just not acceptable. Ex ex expect a a deduction on your next paycheck. Well, it's a good thing it's time for our children's story. And today's children's story is about Odd Velvet. And I really wish my friend Velvet were here to hear this because, you know, I think she would enjoy it. Uh, the book is written by a woman named Mary Whitcomb, and it's illustrated by another woman named Tara Callahan King. Odd Velvet. I don't think I've read this one here before. You may remember it, but I don't. <laughs> Careful. No, I'm just... All right, here we go. On the first day of school, Velvet's classmates brought their teachers cinnamon tea, lace, handkerchiefs, <laughs> okay, handkerchiefs, not chips. Not sure what handkerchiefs are. I suppose there's something you really want, but we'll move on. Handkerchiefs and heart-shaped boxes of potpourri. Velvet handed her teacher an egg carton filled with seven rocks her favorite red shoelaces, and half of a sparrow's egg. Velvet was odd. At lunchtime, Velvet not only carried a used brown paper bag, but inside of it were things like carrots and a butter sandwich, and she ate them. At, recesses, at recess, a few of the girls noticed that Velvet was not wearing a new dress even though it was the beginning of the school year. Where did she come from? They wondered aloud. All of this strangeness did not stop after the first day of school. In fact, it got worse. Velvet brought in a milkweed pod for show and tell. Luckily, three of the other girls brought in a talking girl doll, a wedding doll, and a crying doll and saved the day. Velvet's nose was freckled. She had a pack of only eight crayons and her sweater once belonged to her older sister. Nothing was right about Odd Velvet. Although everyone was polite to her, no one was silly enough to pick Velvet to partner play or to walk home with her after school. No one wanted to be different the way Velvet was different. On the day of the school field trip, the children were laughing and calling each other by their nicknames. Someone called out, what's your nickname, Velvet? I got, it got quiet as Velvet looked around. I don't have one, 
she said. But my father told me that on the day I was born, the sun was just rising over the mountains and outside it looked as though the world had been covered with a blanket of smooth, soft, lavender velvet. A few of the boys let out a giggle, but mostly the bus fell quiet. For a moment, everyone was thinking about how beautiful that morning must have been the day that Velvet was born. The following week, a school drawing contest was announced. There was no question who the winner would be. Sarah Garvey had the best markers, the biggest paint set, and more colored pencils than anyone else in the class. When the day arrived to announce the winner, the children let Sarah sit right up front. No one was more surprised than she was when the teacher called out Velvet's name. Velvet had drawn an apple, just an apple. It's just a piece of fruit, Sarah protested. Everyone stared at the picture and said, it looks so real, I'd like to eat it. It seems like you could pick it up, another child added. Sure enough, with just her eight crayons, Velvet had drawn the most beautiful apple the children had ever seen. Little by little, the things that Velvet said and the things that Velvet did began to make sense. The teacher had Velvet speak for two whole days about her rock collection. She even had ashes from a real volcano. Still, on the day she handed out invitations to her birthday party, the whispering began. I bet her house is old and dark, Sarah said. The thought of going to Velvet's house made everyone a little queasy. Velvet lived in a tiny house at the end of a long road. There was no jungle gym or tether ball, just a tall swing hanging from a big old tree. At the door, Velvet's mom and dad politely asked the children in. There were no birthday ma magicians or wizards, not even a clown, but they got to turn Velvet's room into a castle. The royal subjects painted their faces, put glitter in their hair. They jumped high off the bed into a blue blanket moat. Velvet's sister made each of them golden crowns with colored jewels. They took turns wearing Velvet's royal coat, which was really a bed cover. They played cards and shot marbles. Velvet even showed them how to draw beautiful apples. On the last day of school, Velvet's classmates brought their teachers handfuls of flowers, cards they had made, and an impressive collection of nice looking rocks. Velvet was different, but maybe she wasn't so odd after all. The end. I think that when Jesus lived on earth, people probably thought that Jesus was pretty odd. Jesus did things like nobody else did. Jesus hung out with people that most people wouldn't have dared spend time with. And sometimes Jesus did things that were very hard for other people to understand. But if we spend enough time with Jesus, then we begin to see things in a different way, in a new way, and in a better way. And that's what we're called to do. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for Jesus, and for the odd ways that Jesus looked at the world and taught us to look at the world the very same way. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Now, Karen has our psalm reading. Cheaters. I've got to put my cheaters on. Psalm 19, God's glory and creation and the law. The Psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament, firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, not are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and the words of the Lord, and the words to the end of the world. 
In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy, its rising from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hidden from the heat. But the law of the Lord is perfect, receiving the soul, declares the Lord, are sure making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord is true, and the righteousness altogether. More is to be desired. Are they the more is to be desired? Are they of gold, even much fine gold? Sweeter also than honey and the drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolvent. Do not let them have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The word of the Lord. During Lent, it is our habit to sing our Lenten confessional. This week, we're going to try it a little bit differently. So be patient with me. <laughs> and um, I think this week you can, if you'd like to just remain seated and consider this a time of prayer. So as we enter into prayer, let us sing. I confess, I confess, I confess, I confess to Almighty God, to Almighty God and to you, my brothers, and to you, my brothers. I confess, I confess, I confess, I confess to Almighty God, to Almighty God and to you, my sister, my sister, that I have sinned, I have sinned through my own fault. And in my words, and in my words, that I have sinned, that I have sinned in what I've done, what I've done, and in what, and in what I have failed to do, I have failed to do, and I ask you. And all the church, and all the church, to pray for me, to pray for me. Pray, my brothers, pray, my brothers. And I ask you, and I ask you. And all the church, and all the church, to pray for me, to pray for me. Pray, my sisters, pray, my sisters, and I ask you, and I ask you, to pray for me, to pray for me, to the Lord our God, to the Lord our God. Church, hear the good news. You are forgiven just forgiven. You, you think there may be things that you can't remember that you've sinned and maybe if you don't confess, uh -uh, no, no, no. You, you're forgiven. All those secrets that you don't want anybody to know about, all those things that you think that maybe not that, that doesn't count. No, no. It all counts. 
you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. So we continue our time of prayer. I again encourage you to remember our brothers and sisters in Cuba. I sometimes think one of these days somebody's going to say, do you have to talk about Cuba every Sunday? To which I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to say, yep, sure do. I will keep talking about Cuba as long as there are people starving in Cuba. Now, listen, there are a lot of other places around the world that have big problems. I'm not saying that one country deserves more than the other. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this church is called to the ministry of supporting our sister church in Cuba. They're our family. And when your family is hurting, then you cry out for help. That's what love does, you see. When you love like that, you just can't bear it. You can't stand it to think that, that your family is hungry, that your family is suffering. And so, no, I'm not going to talk, stop talking about Cuba. And I hope that you won't either. I hope that you will talk about Cuba in your prayers. I hope you'll think about Cuba. And please do something. Write the people in power. It does matter. It does. We are on the side of victory. Remember that. The arc of the moral universe may be long. But if all of us get on that moral arc, then it will bend towards justice. Let us pray for that today as we go to God in prayer. Loving God, God who never fails us, God of earth and sea, of fire and rain, and God of kindergarten kids and senior adults, of people living on the streets and of those who own yachts. God, your majesty never ends, your power never fails. Forgive us for believing the lie that you have failed us because we know oh god that your love never fails we know your word tells us that there is nothing we can do to separate ourselves from your love we confess that we have a little fear in our hearts for the people of cuba but you've told us that perfect love cast out fear and so Oh God, fill those hollows of fear with overwhelming love that forces us to align with those who are suffering. Fill those pockets of fear with longing for justice. Fill those pockets of fear with action steps that come from our great love for your people. And justice is exhausting, especially for those who are impacted by it. Forgive us for turning a blind eye. Forgive us for stepping over those that we don't really want to see. Forgive us, oh God, for believing that there is no hope, because in you there is always hope. Even as we proclaim this truth, we confess that there are these names that tickle the backs of our brains demanding attention. They're people we love, they're situations we care about. And so now as we come to this time of worship, when we really want to devote our hearts and minds to you, we lift these names to you, God placing them at the foot of the cross, asking, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Cleanse. 
Claire Mayfield. Stan Hasty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. Now please stand for our second, third? Second, hymn. third. Second, our next hymn. Next hymn. So um, I do apologize. I thought this was in the uh, hymnal, but it's not. It's, we'll, we'll get, no, no. This is just a closer walk with thee, so it should be pretty familiar. Uh, I think it's a great song as we continue on along this Lenten journey, and we're hearing the stories of Jesus and um, what we're going through and what He was going through in, in time leading up to Easter. So uh, it's a great time for us to just think about and just having a closer walk with thee and um, how important that is. So. Hopefully you can just uh, come along, come along, whatever you want to do. Some people may know it, some might not, it's okay. Squat in for the day. Go ahead. Uh, that's fine too. 
Um, but we are going to read our gospel text now. And so if you weren't standing before and you're able, wherever you are, all cuddled up, all stretched out, whatever, go ahead and stand up. If you are able, as we read our gospel text from the gospel of John, take note that we're only in the second chapter of John today. During this third year in the second year in the lectionary, Matthew, Mark, um, we use uh, a lot of John. Mark is the shortest gospel and it's the gospel for this year, but because it is so short, we often fill in sections with John. So um, looking at John chapter two, beginning in verse 13, reading to 22, please hear the word of the Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the body, the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite you, if you do have your Bibles, to keep them open uh, to that text, because in a moment, we're going to go back to that. And uh, so I want, to, I want you to have that handy. Now, we've just read the word, the story of the cleansing of the temple. And so picture that scene in your mind if you will. Close your eyes if you need to and picture that scene that we just read about. What's the first thing that came to your mind? Is it a, a movie scene that you may have seen? A television scene that you may have seen? Is it a work of art? Maybe a, a picture in your Bible or a picture that you saw in Sunday school? The picture in my mind's kind of faded because it was from Sunday school. That picture that comes to your mind, what, what have you included in that scene? How biblically accurate do you think your image is? We just read it. Does the picture in your mind match the text? I mean, maybe it does, but are you sure? In a little town in Northern Italy, there is a chapel called Scrovni Chapel. From the outside, this place looks absolutely plain. You would drive right by and never notice it. I've not been there, but I've seen pictures. It's just brick faces. I don't even think there's hardly any windows, um, but it's very plain looking building. But if you go inside, you will find what experts call one of the greatest masterpieces of Western art. Inside that little chapel in the Padua region of Northern Italy, there are frescoes done by the artist Giotto that narrate events in the life of Christ. And they're all over the inside, it's just one room, at least from the pictures that I've seen, it looks like it's just one room that's completely painted. Among those, oh, these were painted in the 1300s. And among those pictures is one of the cleansing of the temple. So this was done 1305 or so. That's a long time ago, right? That's like 
that's seriously old if if you want to think about it that way long long time ago but even then the picture is not exactly biblically accurate Jesus stands in the middle of the painting. It is 1300, so uh, 14th century art is not quite as vibrant and moving as Renaissance art, though the colors are brilliant. You should study fresco. I went down a, I went to, when I was in Italy, I saw lots of frescoes and that was amazing. And I went down a rabbit hole trying to decide if I was gonna explain fresco to you. I figured y'all could do that on your own. Look up fresco, it's fascinating. The colors are bright still all these years later, vibrant colors, frescoes don't fade. So Jesus stands static in the middle of the picture and he is behind him is this white temple structure and overturned at his feet is a table. On either side of Jesus, people are backing away, looking absolutely terrified. Jesus has his arm raised and his fist is clenched tight. He holds a whip in his hand and he holds on to a, a frightened man with his other hand. And the man's trying to escape. The animals in the picture are not really prevalent. They're sort of outside of the focus of Jesus. That's not what scripture says. If you go ahead and proceed through the history of art, you will see hundreds of pictures of this scene with various levels of violence involved. They tend to get more and more violent the later it gets to our time. So the Renaissance pictures are very violent with all kinds of action and pain and grimaces on their faces. Don't underestimate the power of art to inform our thinking. I think of that as a correct depiction of the scripture, don't you? We just read it. That's the picture that I had in my mind. Is that similar to the picture you had in your mind? Mad, angry Jesus throwing people out with a whip. Here's the thing. Raging Violet Jesus may sell paintings and movies, but it's not here in the text. I know, I, I, I'm going to show you, I promise you. So take a look at your John text here, but let me just say that this text, this story is in all four Gospels. Now, here's the difference between John and the other three. Matthew gives it two verses. John, Mark gives it three verses. Luke gives it two verses. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written earlier than John. John was written in part to tell the story from a distance. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written with a greater urgency to get the story down close to when it happened. John has had some time to think about these things. And John writes with some interpretation of the events. Now, it's right, it, again, it's right here. Let me, let me just show you. Um, look at verse 17. His disciples remembered later. You don't remember the event while it's happening. You remember it later. So later they remembered, oh, you know what? I know why he did that. It's because the zeal for your house will consume me. That's not all. There's more here. Um, in verse 22, after he was raised from the dead. Well, he's not even, he hadn't even gone on trial yet. How do they know he's going to be raised from the dead? Well, because it's been 90 years, roughly. And so they said they remember this. Oh, Jesus was talking about his body. That's what's raised. Wonder what that means to us now. And that was the purpose of John. A very fun exercise, some might say, is to go through the book of John and underline all of those places 
where you see something like, and that happened because of, and if you want to know why this happened, it was this thing. It's all through John. Very little of that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, in all three of those other places, it's shown just a little differently because it's much shorter. There's not a lot of commentary. But let's go back to talking about what the Greek says. I mean, Jesus was a human. Surely he got angry. There's, there's nothing wrong with anger. Anger can promote very good actions. If it's do it, be angry and do not sin, that's the goal. Anger's okay. It's the sinning that's the problem. So it's okay that Jesus got angry, but Violet grabbing people by the neck with a whip in the other hand, that should bother you. That should really trouble you when all you've ever heard about Jesus is Jesus' love and light and goodness and grace. So let's see what it says. In the Greek, the first thing it says is that this cord that Jesus made is a version of the word we talked about a week or so ago called ekbalo. Remember, ekbalo means cast out. Get it out of here. That's what ekbalo meant. So this cord, this rope made of cords, was a tool to expel things, to get something out of there. That's the first thing, all right? So we're still tracking along the painting here. But what did Jesus cast out? Let's look. 15, making a tool to cast people or cast something out, making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple. Who? Both sheep and cattle. I don't see anybody getting grabbed around the neck. Do you? What did he do to the people? We well, threw their money out. You want to get at somebody, toss out their money. So he threw their money out, overturned the tables. Now, you may say, well, but it says he drew them out. He drove them out. But the Greek makes it plain that the them was the sheep and the cows. That's who Jesus drove out. Well, how do you get a sheep to move? You have a little thing that you hit them with. I'm not saying that's a good idea. I don't know anything about sheep. I just know that that's... The way you get them to move, that's the way people get oxen to move. But the money changers, what did he do to them? He did two things. First, he threw over, out their money, and second, he overturned their tables. That's what he did to the money changers. Now, if you're a money changer and your money gets thrown out and your table gets thrown over, where are you? You're under the table getting your money back, right? You're not going to go anywhere else because there's people around. They're going to get your money, right? So you're going to, I mean, have you ever dropped a quarter at the, at the cash register and made a plum fool at yourself trying to get your quarter back? Well, this is their whole livelihood that he just threw away. And so they're, they're scurrying around to get it. They're on the ground trying to get their money. At least that's what I think. I don't think we can overstate how important it is that Jesus was not violent here. I think Jesus is angry. I think Jesus made a scene. But I do not think that the Jesus that we know and love whipped human beings out of anger. I don't believe that because I know Jesus. I also don't believe it because it's not in the Bible. It's not here. So what is the significance of this scene? Let's erase all of those violet images and let's start fresh. The thing is, you don't have to add violence to the scene for it to be a pretty crazy scene, do you? I mean, there's animals running everywhere. He's like, animals are running all over the place and people are scrambling to get their coins. I mean, you can picture that in Walmart, what it would look like. So let alone at the temple. So it was a scene, it was seen enough. It doesn't sell as many movies, but it was seen enough. 
So what happened? Well, Jesus goes to the to Jerusalem. Why does Jesus go to the Jerusalem? Because it's the Passover. He goes to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover as all good Jews do. And he gets there and there's certain things that Jesus expects to see. Jesus expects to see people who can change money from Roman currency to the sanctuary shekel. See, the Roman currency had Caesar's face on it. And we have no God. We, Caesar's not our God, right? Um, that was one of the chants, at least in Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, we have no God but Caesar. That's what Caesar wanted followers of Christ to say. But no, Jewish people said, we are not going to have the face of Caesar in our house of worship. And so they created a sanctuary shekel that was fair trade in the temple courtyard where trades were regularly made. It was here in this outer court. They weren't inside the temple. They were in the outer courtyard. And the reason there were animals was, were there is because the law was that you had to pay a temple tax. The law was that you had to offer a sacrifice at Passover. That was the law. Jesus knew the law. Jesus studied the law. All of Jesus's friends studied the law. He knew this. He expected this. And so he gets there and all of this is happening. And Jesus reacts in a way that is unfamiliar to us and is frankly uncomfortable. See, the thing is, Jesus did know Torah. Jesus did know the law, but Jesus also challenged the law. All through the Sermon on the Mount, you hear, you have heard it said, but I say, this is the law, but let's look at it a different way. That was Jesus's mojo. What's the law? Hmm. What if we went at it this way? And so Jesus goes to the temple and he's learned all this. He knows this. And, you know, he's also, he knows about the history of the people. He knows they were slaves in Egypt. He knows about the journey into the promised land. He knows all of this. So why did it hit him different this time? Because he knew that there, had, there was a time now for change. There were injustices in this system that Jesus just could not abide anymore. It was too much. And so he, he challenged the system. He challenged the system in a public way. Not out of violence, though, but out of perfect love, you see. Jesus' perfect love for humanity created in him this longing for a better way, a better system. Jesus said, you know, I, I got in here, I stepped over the poor, the cast offs, the cripples on the way here, because, you know, they would have been lined up on the road asking for alms. Jesus passed by all of those, and I think it was just one time too many. I think Jesus just said, enough. This is not what it's about. It's not about the money and the sacrifices. That's not what it's about. Jesus knew. Jesus grew up hearing the temple is where you meet God. But Jesus suddenly on that, in that moment, saw that there was a better way. And since that time, we've been meeting God in all kinds of places. We don't have to go to the temple to meet God anymore. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew there was a time, it had come to the time he couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't go to the temple one more time and walk by a broken person and not see them, in them, the face of God. He said, that's an, I can't do it anymore. So where's our temple? 
I mean, surely we believe in Christ's resurrection. We believe in taking Christ into our lives and letting Christ rule in our hearts. But where else do we see God? The Celtics have a tradition they call thin places, or else it's an ideology, not a tradition. And they say that thin places are places that are, the, the wall between heaven and earth is so thin that you can see God right through it. And you might think, oh yeah, that's that time that was so great in my life. And yeah, I think we do see God in celebrations and in victories. But thin places are often found most readily in the dark places, in the broken places. Because when we're experiencing darkness, it's a whole lot easier to see the light, right? If we lit a candle right here, you couldn't see it from the kitchen, really, unless the lights were out. If you haven't been in here where the lights are out, it is D-A-R-K dark. So the Celtics taught us that we can look for God everywhere, but they're not the only ones who taught us that. Jesus taught us that. Jesus said, you want to experience Christ? Well, spend some time with the poor. You want to experience Christ, be with those who are mourning, with those who are hungry, because where people are mourning, Jesus is weeping too. And where people are hungry, Christ is right there with them. We encounter Jesus with the prisoner, the prostitute, the fallen evangelist, in the animal shelter, the food pantry, the street. We don't have to go to a temple or church to access God. Jesus has torn that veil away and invites us to come together with other believers to worship and praise and serve freely that we might shine the love of God into the depths of pain, into the heights of rejection. And then as we step into the breadth of oppression, we can shine God's light. And therein, others will be like, wow, are we in a temple or something? Because this feels really sacred. Let us pray. Loving God, you invite us to a new way, a different way. Help us to accept your invitation and step towards those you step towards. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I, amen. And now I invite you, friends, to come to the table. I invite you to come and share the meal given to us by Christ as we take the Lord's Supper today. Today, um, Cliff is going to help me with the liturgy for the first time, so thank you, Cliff, for joining us um, in our liturgy this morning. Oops, let me get the cup. And... Okay. Yeah. Be good. Mm -hmm. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks. And then he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Eso es mi cuerpo, que por ustedes es partido. Hagan esto en memoria de mí. After supper, Jesús tomó la copa y les dijo a sus discípulos, Esta copa es la nueva alianza en mi sangre. This is the new covenant of my blood, the new covenant that is shed for forgiveness and joy. Drink it, all of you, in memory of me. Bendice, Señor, nuestro pan. Bless, O oh God, this bread. Give bread to those who are hungry. And hunger for justice for those that have bread. Bless, O oh God, this cup. Give it to those who are thirsty. And thirst 
for justice to those who have something to drink. Receive these gifts of God, for you are the people of God. Receive these gifts of God, for you are the children of God. Receive these gifts of God, for God loves you and all of you. Amen. Come to the table. For the bread we have eaten, for the cup we have received, for the, for the life we have been, been given, given, we, we give, give you, O God, God, our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. Amen. Amen. You have heard the word of God, sung and read and prayed and preached. You've even taken the word of God into your own body. And so now I invite you to respond in whatever way you feel led. You may feel like, you know what? I've never been baptized and it's time. I want to be baptized. And if that's the case, we invite you into that experience of connection with the body of Christ. You may think, well, I, I've been baptized in another church, but I really feel like I belong here. And if, if that's your story, we invite you to join Ecclesia. We'd love for you to be officially part of the family. Of course, you're already far, part of the family. It's kind of like the difference between being engaged and being married. You're already here. We already got you. But we invite you to join the church in an official capacity if you feel so led. You may feel called to support the financial concerns of the church, and if that is the case for you, we invite you to do that as well. However you feel led to, be res to respond, I will be over here on this side as we sing our final hymn. All right, so we've got another new one today. It's um, something cool about you know, stepping in and helping out with the music is finding some new songs as you look at the, uh, the message. So I think this one's very uh, famous song. It's called The Father's House. Y'all have... Um, music printed out and it's very adequate to the message, great message by the way. Um, when you read that scripture you start thinking about what you're talking about. No, this is my Jesus and you know, this song is talking about my father's house and that can be a many things. When I was a kid I was taught early on that church isn't just here where we're at, it's where you're at. So I challenge us all to you know, take these lyrics home with you if you've never heard this song before, read through them, let them resonate with you 
Uh, and how you're taking your tempo and where you're going with your tempo. So everybody stand up and let's, uh, you'll learn it as, as I do because I just learned it last night. <clears throat> but it's a great song. beautiful message. I love that song, Chris. Thank you so much. For those of you who are watching online, you can look up the song, The Father's House by Corey Asbury. Um, and I'll try to put a link to this in our um, video so that you all can, if you're online, you can get it that way. Um, I really appreciate this, the message here that says, lay your burdens down here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door because it ain't welcome here anymore. You're in the Father's house. And here and everywhere, you are loved. And there is nothing you can do about it. Thanks for worshiping with Ecclesia. I hope you'll stay for lunch. We'll see you next week. <laughs>